These are the notes on the isotopes of Penium Lab, our second penny-based lab. The first lab we did with pennies involved flipping them, so that really could have been any old iron, any old coin that we flipped. Could have been nickels, dimes, quarters, etc. Okay, other currencies, pesos, euros. Because we were really just modeling the half-life. And in a half-life, you expect half of the sample to decay. And then, of course, our data looked a little bit like this, but not exactly like this, because we only had 100. But really, that's the reason we were flipping coins, because of the statistical likelihood of getting 50% decayed, 50% remaining for each time we flip them. So that's why the model works so well. And we just decided to pick tails as being the radioactive atom and heads as the decayed atom. And then the decayed ones got removed, the sample shrunk. So hopefully now it makes sense to you why the radioactive decay curve occurs because the sample is shrinking. The rate of decay is remaining the same, 50% for each half-life, but the size of the sample is shrinking. It's always 50-50. I mean, unless the penny lands on its side, like in that Twilight Zone episode, and then you have good luck all day until it falls over. Okay, spoiler. So now we are doing another lab with pennies, but this time it couldn't be quarters, like maybe, I don't know, over in Beverly Hills, maybe they do the penny half-life lab with quarters, the quarter half-life lab. But then each set would be like $25 worth of coins. I don't know. It's too pricey for me. But in this case, in the isotopes of Pennium Lab, we have no choice but using pennies because pennies are unique, as you will find. The penny. It has Abraham Lincoln's head on it. Almost everybody agrees, the greatest president we've ever had. It's one of the only things people agree on, by the way. And a red cent, they used to call it. He hasn't always been on the coin. I wonder what the coin looked like before that. I wonder how the coin has changed over time. I wonder what the penny is made of, etc. Well, before we get to that, let's talk about isotopes. Do you remember that there is more than one kind of each element, what I mean is, if you look at the different nuclides, there can be some variation in one element. Because the only thing you really need to be an element is the right number of protons. So if you only have one proton, for example, you are decidedly, definitely, without a doubt, hydrogen. There's no debating it. But if you only have a proton, well, that's really all you need. So we call that hydrogen one. It also has a nickname, protium. On the other hand, sometimes you wind up with something stuck to that proton. That, that happened in the star, somehow, in the conditions in the plasma in the core of a star. A neutron happened to get stuck to a proton, and it stayed that way. That's what we call hydrogen two. Still hydrogen, but it's another isotope. It has a nickname deuterium. Then sometimes, even less likely, you can get two neutrons that get stuck to a proton in a star's core again. And that turns out to work as well. That is called hydrogen three or tritium. So most hydrogen is just hydrogen one, over 99% of it is. A very small amount is deuterium, hydrogen two, and then a vanishingly small, extremely low amount is hydrogen three, because that's just not that likely to form or to remain without being becoming part of another uh, nucleus with nuclear fusion occurring all around it. So these are the only three isotopes of hydrogen. They have the same number of protons. They are all hydrogen, but they have different numbers of neutrons, and therefore a different number of nucleons, right? And they would have a different mass. Each of them has a different mass. 
Because if you think about it, a neutron and a proton are pretty much the same mass. They do differ just slightly, but let's just say they're each about the same. So that means that hydrogen 2 would have twice the mass of hydrogen 1, and hydrogen 3 would have triple the mass of hydrogen 1, and that is true. So what if you had a water molecule that instead of having hydrogen 1 for both of the hydrogens in the H2O, what if one of those H's was hydrogen 2? Well, then that water molecule would be just a little heavier than a regular old water molecule, a typical water molecule. Or what if it had hydrogen 3 as one of those hydrogen in the H2O? That would be even heavier. And if it's heavier with the same volume, well, that would actually increase its density. So guess where you can find hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3 in water molecules? Guess where you would find those water molecules? Because of their increased density, they wind up sinking to the bottom of the ocean. So if you look at water at the bottom of the ocean, it has a higher amount of deuterium and tritium, and then that's where they look for it, and they can filter it out, and they have many uses for deuterium in nuclear power plants and many other uses. Tritium is extremely rare. It would be great if we could find a whole bunch of tritium. That would be fantastic. But there's very, very little found on the Earth. So if you think about it, all three of these isotopes are hydrogen, but they all have different masses. Get it? Get it? These are the nuclides of isotopes. So what they have in common is they're all hydrogen. What is different about them is they have different masses. Remember that. So on the periodic table, if we zoom in on an element, like, oh, I don't know, lithium, let's zoom in on a lithium. It's too small to see there. Bing, 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 bing. Why isn't it exactly 7.00 for that mass number? Because doesn't it either need to have a neutron or not? Doesn't it either need to have a proton or not? Obviously, lithium needs to have three protons. Look at the number on top, the atomic number is Z. So why is it 6.94? Well, it turns out that lithium-7 is the most common isotope of lithium, and this is the nuclide of it, looking at just the nucleus of that isotope. And of course, if you look at the little one down and to the left, see the 7 above the 3? Think of that as a little subtraction problem. We never show the neutrons because they're just not important enough to get their own number. So 7 minus 3, oh, that's how we find the neutrons. 7 minus 3 is 4. You can also visually see them here. This is about as big as you can get and still see all of them from one side. So notice that the green ones are neutrons, there's four. The three are protons. Well, of course there's three protons. It's lithium. That's why the nuclide written at the top doesn't even mention the three, because you cannot be lithium without three protons. You can't have more, you can't have less. Five is right out. You have to have three. Okay, by the way, it's called lithium because it's in rocks. That's where the name came from. It's from rocks. There's also lithium-6, which of course it's lithium. It has to have three protons. And then look at the one down, the nuclide down and to the left. Six minus three. Well, of course that's three. Oh yeah, the N over Z would be, what would it be? One, because three divided by three, right? You'd have to flip those over. It would be neutrons above protons. Three over three equals 1.00. And that's what we expect to find, really, for a small nucleus. We expect to find an N over Z of 1. And that's what we usually find. But lithium-7 didn't have that, did it? Lithium-6 does. So you might expect this to be the more common form of lithium. But nope. Turns out, 92.5% of lithium is lithium-7. Only the remaining 7.5% is made up of lithium-6. So this goes for any lithium you ever find. If you get it out of a rock, so again, that's why it's called lithium, and you isolate it, well, then you're going to have both of them mixed together in these proportions. When we see the demo with lithium in our um, reactivity lab, you will see the lithium, but you won't be able to tell, but it does have lithium-7 in it and lithium-6. It's both of them. 
So what we need to do to figure out the atomic mass of lithium is we have to take the weighted average of these two isotopes. Lithium is easy because it only has two. A lot of other elements have many, many isotopes that you have to include. So I'm using an easy example, but you could imagine how to extrapolate this concept, right? You can imagine if there were more, you just keep on going, okay? So 92.5%, that's a BS unit. Percent is not a unit. It just means this number has been magnified by a factor of 100. This number has been multiplied by 100. So to get back to what it really means, you put the 92.5 on the top of a fraction, put 100 on the bottom, and then divide by 100 to get back to the fractional abundance, okay? Or the decimal form of the percentage. It's a unitless ratio. I know that's a bunch of, a bunch of funny terms. Basically, how about this? You move the decimal two places to the left. When you divide by 100, it moves the decimal over twice to the left. So what would that be? For 92.5%, that would be 0 0.925. That's, that's the unitless ratio. There wouldn't be anything after that. And then what would 7.5% be? It's not 0 0.75. It's 0 0.075. Got it? Because 0 0.75 is 75%, right? So anyway, once you know the abundance, and they have to find this, by the way, by checking lithium all over the place and seeing what this percentage is. This has been determined by experimentation, by measurement, okay? You turn the 92.5% into its decimal form, and then you multiply by the mass of lithium-7, which happens to be this, 7.016003 AMU, atomic mass units. And when you multiply those, that gives the contribution of lithium-7 to the weighted average. Got it? So since 0 0.925 is almost 1, the number is going to be almost 7, isn't it? It turns out to be 6.4898 AMU. Okay. Then we do the same thing with lithium-6. Notice on the left there, 0 0.075. That is the decimal form or the fractional abundance of the 7.5%. That's what it really means. Times the mass of lithium-6, which happens to be this. And then, of course, we're going to get a much smaller contribution here, right? Because look at that number on the left. That's way less than 1. It's even less than 0.1. So the number is going to be less than 10% as much as 6, right? It's going to be a very small number. And it turns out it is 0 0.451134 AMU. That's the contribution from lithium-6 to the mass of lithium. And then, guess what? we got to add all the contributions up. We only have two here, but if we had more, we just keep on going, add them all up, keep adding them until we finally get the weighted average, which is the atomic mass of lithium. That's the one we put on the periodic table, except we don't usually go to the thousandths place and the ten thousandths place. We usually round it to the hundredths place. Hundredths place. So look, see the 6.94 there at the bottom? That's how they calculate that, using the weighted average of all the different nuclides, all the different isotopes of lithium. Got it? So the funny thing about this is that you don't always have to do all this work. This has been done for you on the periodic table, right? But for now, you've got to see where this number comes from. And that is the main point of this lab, exactly this kind of calculation, figuring out how you do a weighted average. Okay. By the way, I like to call it atomic mass. Another name for it is atomic weight. But it is not a weight. It is a mass. Mass is different than weight. Okay, on the periodic tables we'll be using in this class, they're made by Thomas Jefferson Laboratory, speaking of presidents. And on them it says atomic weight. I wrote to the guys, they wrote back, and they said they feel justified in using the outmoded term of atomic weight because it's a weighted average. Seriously, that was their explanation. I know those guys are real smart, but that is not a good answer. So anyway, try to use atomic mass 
That's what Pimble prefers anyway. Okay. So how does this relate to a penny? Oh, speaking of Thomas Jefferson Laboratory, well, what about Abraham Lincoln? Okay, Abraham Lincoln, the greatest president we've ever had. I think everybody agrees about that. Okay, so we put him on our smallest denomination coin. What? Okay, he's on bills as well. But smallest denomination coin, really? Is that what he deserves? I don't know. But if you look at a penny, it's interesting to think of what it's made of, a very distinctive metal that is given away by its color, right? It's just obvious, right? Copper. Copper is one of the few metals that has a distinctive color. Copper and gold have very distinctive colors. Most metals are silver or gray or silver gray or some combination. Does anybody know what the symbol for copper is on the periodic table? Well, I will see you in class, and that is the symbol for copper, C-U. But it's interesting. Yeah, copper starts with a C. That makes sense. But there's no U in the word copper, unless you misspell it, I guess. Okay? You'll never get me, copper, right? Um, so why is it C-U? Well, it turns out this is one of the only 11 exceptions to English on the periodic table. There are only 11 elements on the whole periodic table that the symbol doesn't match the English name. So what you know about this is, oh, that means it must have been known way, way back. It's got to have ancient names. It's got to have names in like Latin or Greek. That's usually the case. So it means it's an element that has been used by people for a long time, probably thousands of years, and it was named after an island. See that island in the middle of the picture? That is the island where copper gets its name. Here's the name in Greek. I believe it's pronounced Kupros. That's the Greek letter version of it. And that island is surprisingly not in Greece. It is, if you look on that map there, on that picture, that's Turkey right above it. And Lebanon is off to the right where those clouds are at. And there's some clouds on the island as well. Today we have a different name for that island. Can you think of it? It's not that far from Greece. It's in the Mediterranean. What's the name of this island? Does anybody know? We call this the island of Cyprus. There it is on a map. See Cyprus over in the eastern Mediterranean where that red dot is? Copper was named after the island of Cyprus where much of the ancient copper was mined. So the Egyptians got their copper from there. The Phoenicians got their copper from there. The Greeks, the Romans, you know, the Persians, Lots of people got their copper from there, so they just started calling it the metal from that island. And they eventually just called it the island's name, which was Kupros. And then gradually that changed into the word copper in English, at least. Okay. Interestingly, the island of Cyprus itself was named after a tree that grows there, but it also grows in California. You probably see these around. These are cypress trees. Now notice the difference in spelling. The Cypress tree is ESS. -S. The island of Cyprus, which sounds about the same, is US. But it sounds about the same, huh? And those are the tall, skinny trees. Okay, they're conifers and um, they don't have flowers. They're gymnosperms and um, they grow perfectly straight. I guess, unless it's really windy. I guess, even if it is really windy, huh? And those are the trees they make telephone poles out of. Go figure. There's very few trees that grows straight enough to make a telephone pole, okay? If you get a big enough tree, you could cut one out of the middle, of course. But isn't that interesting? Okay, so how did that become the word copper? Well, in Latin, they called the island cuprum. Okay, Greek was cupros, Latin was cuprum, and in English, we call it cypress, but those are all kind of similar if you think about it. They all have a k sound at the beginning, and they have a P and the R. Think about it. So they're not that different. I know each language is unique. And then they took the CU from the Latin version of the name, and that's where we got the symbol on the periodic table, and that's why copper is CU on the periodic table. Interesting, right? So what's made of copper? Well, pennies, right? It's obvious, right? Just look at it. Look at that copper. 
I can see it right there. What else is made of copper? Oh, you know, the Statue of Liberty is made of copper. Oh yeah, it did look like that for about a decade before it oxidized in the air. There are very few pictures of it. In fact, the pictures of it from its first 10 years, they didn't have color photography, so they had to be colorized. This is a colorized picture. But the Statue of Liberty is made of copper. It's not even brass or bronze, it's just copper. So that cartoon movie that they set in France while they were building the Statue of Liberty before they gave it to the United States, where they show it being built and it's already green, eh, incorrect. And I cannot rem remember the name of that movie. It's like Jump or Leap or something like that, where they're dancing and singing. And my kids watch that. I, d I don't know. It isn't, I would not recommend it. It's not that great. Okay, sorry about that. So the U.S. penny goes all the way back to pretty soon after the founding of the nation. Early on, it had Lady Liberty on the front. That was the head side. And she has her very aquiline nose, like whoosh, like a cliff, right? Then we had an eagle. That's kind of cool, actually. Then there was a Native American head. It was called the Indian head penny. And finally, we ended up with our greatest president, Abraham Lincoln. And he's been on it for quite a while. So the last time that Abraham Lincoln was not on the U.S. penny was 1908. So they waited 44 years after his assassination before they honored him on a coin with our lowest denomination. Think about that. The greatest president, the lowest denomination coin. And then, in 1909, they began putting Lincoln on the front of the penny. Look at that. It looks just like the pennies we make today. There was a big announcement, putting Lincoln on the penny. And back then, a penny could still buy you something, but not too much anymore. And of course, just as you think, just as everybody thinks, of course, made of copper. Well, 95% copper, because it turns out Copper is a little bit too flexible. So if you want to make a coin very durable and not get chipped and dented and bent, if you mix in just 5% zinc, mix it up, make a little brass, it's a lot more durable. So technically not 100% copper, but pretty close, just like people think. So why do I keep saying that? Well, because along came WWII, and suddenly copper was in short supply. They needed copper to make all the wiring for tanks and ships and planes for the war effort against the Axis powers, right? We fought against those fascists, right? Well, it turned out that we were overproducing steel and we were having a shortage of copper, so somebody got the bright idea. I know, it's an emergency. We can do whatever we want. Let's just not make pennies out of copper for one year, save all that copper and send it out to whichever factory needs it, and we'll just use our surplus of steel to make the penny. So for one year, the U.S. penny was made out of steel. But then they didn't want it to rust too fast, and steel has a tendency to do that. So they just put a little bit of zinc on the surface, they galvanized it, and that made it last longer without rusting, okay? The problem with making a coin out of steel is it is paramagnetic, and it will stick to magnets, even electromagnets. So let's say like, you know, vending machines and things that make little magnetic fields, you, you can have problems with that. So that's the only coin that we've ever made in this country that is paramagnetic, that'll stick to a magnet, okay? So it turned out after just making coins out of steel for one year, they saved enough copper for the rest of the war and they didn't have to do it again. So the very next year they went back to just making pennies the way they had, although now a lot of the copper they were using wasn't as pure, it was sort of recycled from other sources. And so it had a little bit of tin in it, okay? So that making it a little bit bronzy. So it's a little bit 
more bronzy than the one had been before 1943. So isn't that interesting? In just one year, pennies went from being 95% copper, 5% zinc, to being steel. And then the very next year, they went back to pretty much the original composition, but with little trace amounts of tin mixed in there. Now, I wonder if that would be detectable in the mass of the penny. Don't you think if you make a penny out of a totally different material that it's going to have a different mass? Oh, yes, it will. So don't you think that the 1943 penny would have a different mass than the earlier penny? Yes, it would. And isn't that very much like an isotope? To be the same thing like a penny, but to have a different mass. Like to be another atom of hydrogen, but to have a different mass. Get it? Or another atom of lithium, but to have a different mass. So you can think of each different mass of the penny as being a different isotope of a macroscopic element we're going to call pennium. Let's keep going. What happened after that? Well, there was a little change in 1962. They went back to the very original composition. No more tin was included. But the biggest change ever in the history of the U.S. penny, other than 1943, happened when I was a kid back in the 80s when they realized, you know what, copper's getting pretty pricey. The price of copper is just going up and up and up. It's getting ridiculous to use it in the smallest denomination currency. So why don't we just flip the composition of the penny? Why don't we just make them out of zinc? But then they remembered that when they did that 1943 experiment, making the coins out of steel, people pretty much flipped out. They pretty much could not believe that they had made the penny look like that. And people were getting it confused with the dime, which for some strange reason is the smallest coin we have, even though it's worth 10 cents and it doesn't say 10 cents on it. It says one dime. So what if you don't know what that means You're from another country, even if you speak English and you don't know what one dime means, you won't know how much it's worth. I don't know. I'm not suggesting you trick people that don't know that. Anyway, so they decided to make it out of zinc, but not cause such an uproar this time. Why don't we just, you know, trick people into thinking it's made of copper? I know. Just put a little tiny bit of copper on the outside. And that's what they've been doing since 1982. They've been making our pennies out of zinc. 97.6% zinc, which is a silver-colored metal, just like your typical metal. Most metals are silver or gray or silvery gray. And then just sort of electroplate a little bit of copper on the outside. Just put a very tiny amount, 2.4%. That's enough to trick people. And it's been working. People have still believed that pennies are made of copper because it does look like that, even while they're secretly made of zinc. And this has been the case since 1982, and people are being fooled and hoodwinked and tricked. So now you know that a penny, most of the pennies you find, most of the pennies you get, are going to be actually made of zinc, despite their appearance. Now, don't you think that's going to have a different mass? Yes. And isn't that going to be another isotope? Get it? If these pennies are atoms of the same element, the ones with different masses are different isotopes. Getting it? By the way, everything else is made of copper. The quarter, copper. The dime, copper. The nickel, copper. Well, not entirely. The quarter and the dime are 92% copper. Okay, so that's not all of it. The nickel is 75% copper. Interesting. Pennies are the ones that have the least copper. Isn't that ironic? So it's almost like we're being tricked to think that pennies are made of copper when they're not. And then we're being tricked also to think all the other coins are not made of copper when they actually are. Pretty funny, right? Pretty funny. I wonder what makes up the rest of the nickel. 
Huh. What makes up the rest of the nickel? Hmm. Well, the rest of the nickel, as you can see here, is nickel. So a nickel is 75% copper and it's 25% nickel. So again, a nickel is 25% nickel. Get it? And, or you could say a nickel is a quarter nickel. How about that? Then, of course, we've got uh, the dime and the quarter and the half dollar, which all have the same composition, mostly copper, and then the rest of it is also nickel. So they have nickel too. And then there's the dollar coin, but who uses that? Who uses that? Speaking of coins, the dime used to have, before it had Roosevelt, it had mercury on it, the mythical Roman god. And they used to be made of silver, by the way. So if you find any old dimes, you might not want to spend them. They're probably worth more than 10 cents. And I think it's funny, if you look on the back of the old dime, there's an interesting symbol there. See that bunch of sticks strapped together with leather with an ax in the middle? What is that called? What is that called? Oh yeah, that's that ancient Roman symbol of power. What's it called? What's it called? Oh yeah, the fasces. The fasces was the ancient Roman symbol of power. Okay, they were trying to represent the strength of a bundle when it's tied together and something like that, capital punishment and all that. But sadly, that was later adopted by the fascists. That is where the name fascism comes from, this bundle. But isn't it weird that it used to be on the American dime? And then it's also in the U.S. Capitol on the wall there. That's a picture from the U.S. Capitol. But to be fair, at the time that we made that dime and at the time that that was on the wall, it was not yet the symbol of fascism. That was created later. Okay, it became the symbol of fascism. In 1921 when Mussolini used it to create that movement okay so at the time it was just a symbol of power it's also in the Lincoln Monument on his chair so it's all over the place so it's too bad that symbol has been co-opted by evil people okay and has become the symbol of fascism I just thought that was interesting I guess that doesn't have much to do with isotopes of pentium oh well so Pennies of different masses will represent isotopes of an imaginary element we're going to call pentium. And if it was on the periodic table, it would have the symbol PE, capital P, lowercase e. Okay? So this would be a macroscopic element. Wouldn't that be great if we could just measure the atoms, you know, on a balance with our own hands, not these itty bitty microscopic atoms that we have to can't even see, can't even grab or measure with tweezers. We're talking about something we can hold in our hands and measure on a balance. Isn't this a good analogy? You see where this is going? So when you get your set of isotopes and your balance, you want to turn on the balance and zero it. And the very first thing you want to measure, you might want to tear your balance to be safe, T-A-R-E, tear it is all of the pennies together, all 20 pennies. We've got 20 there, make sure it's 20. Now it's a very special bunch of pennies, so don't drop them on the floor. They're not easily swapped out with other pennies. Put all the pennies together on the balance. You might have to stack them up and get the mass. Write that here. Now notice how I wrote the unit. You might say that's redundant because it already has a G off to the side. I don't care. I'm going to write my units. Please write your units for every single number, every single number that you write. Okay. Then I'm going to take the pennies off the balance. I'm going to put them in order by year, put them in chronological order, oldest to youngest. And then I'm going to write down the year of each penny like this. Let's say 1977. Then I'm going to measure that 1977 penny alone on the balance after tearing and write down what it says, its mass to the hundredth of a gram. The only problem is 3.37 grams is very accurate. It's a little too accurate because any little defect on the penny, any little, any little piece of dirt that's stuck on it or whatever, any piece that's chipped off is going to change that last digit. You might even notice if you breathe on the balance, it changes that last digit. 
Okay, so what we need to do in order to sort them into isotopes is round the mass to the tenth of a gram. What's going to happen if I round 3.37 grams to the tenth of a gram? It is going to be what? 3 point, well, we're going to get rid of that 7, but the 7 is bigger than 5, so it's going to round the 3 up to a 4. So it's going to be 3.4 grams. Got it? And then for the rounded masses, I'm going to group them into isotopes. So that's the first one. I'm just going to call it isotope A. Here's another penny. Let's say 2012 penny. And I measure its mass. Let's say the mass winds up being 3.24 grams. Well, when I round that to the tenth of a gram, what does that round to? 3.2 grams, right? And that's different than isotope A. So we're going to call this one isotope B. Then we will keep going, labeling each new rounded mass as a new isotope letter going through the alphabet. There's going to be a C. There's going to be a D. Some of the isotope sets have E, maybe even F. Okay? So be careful. Round the mass to the tenth of a gram, and then sort them into isotope groups. So let's say later one of the other pennies also winds up a 3.4 gram. Well, that's the same as isotope A, so that's also A. If I get a 3.2 gram, Penny later on, doesn't matter where it is, that's also an isotope B. So you're going to sort them all into different groupings of isotopes. And then the first question on the next page asks you how many there are of each isotope, like how many A's, how many B's. Then you're going to give a fractional abundance, like what percentage is it of the total. It's out of 20. So let's say you had, you know, 10 of them were isotope A, right? Well, that's 10 out of 20. So you think, oh, that's 50%. But in decimal form, or fractional abundance, it's 0 0.50. So we're going to have it that way because that's how we multiply it. You're going to use the rounded masses as the mass of the isotopes. And we're going to try to get the mass number for pentium, like the number that would go on the periodic table if it was a real element, if it was PE, Okay, what would its mass number be? What would its atomic mass be? Then, after you find the atomic mass of pentium, there's a several questions on the lab, and then I want you to do the lab report. The lab report is a little redundant. Some of the questions on the lab are similar, so just be a little bit more expansive on the lab report. How do isotopes of the same element differ? You could also say what makes them the same. Give an example of how an isotope can be used. You might have to do some research, unless I've mentioned one. I might have mentioned one when we were talking about radioactive decay of certain elements. Oh, I don't know, carbon-14. Think about how that could be used. How are mass numbers calculated, also called atomic mass, and very occasionally atomic weight, even though it is not a weight. It is not a weight. It is a weighted average, but it's not a weight. Okay, describe the analogy used in this lab, like what did the penny stand for? What did the different masses stand for? How well does it match? Like what really works and what doesn't? There's a few things about this, if you really think about it, don't quite work as an analogy. Like what would represent like the neutron in this situation? You know what I mean? So anyway, um, think about a few things that match and a few things that don't. After the lab report, please try the challenges. One challenge is how much greater is the mass of $5 in pennies than the mass of $5 in $1 bills? That would be five $1 bills. You're going to base this on your mass, atomic mass of pentium, right? And then think about how many pennies would it take to be $5 worth. And then come up with the mass. By the way, the mass of a dollar, if you didn't get the chance to measure a dollar, 
it just turns out that a dollar is one gram. A dollar is very, very close to exactly one gram. It can sometimes be a little below, a little above, uh, depending if it's torn or has dirt on it. Another interesting thing is that a nickel is five grams, very, very close to being 5.00 grams. And I noticed that a peso was actually four grams. Okay, I just found that out recently. And surprisingly, a quarter isn't that much more than a nickel. The mass of a quarter isn't even six grams. So it looks so much bigger, but it's thinner. So it's, it's I forget what, it, it's not an exact number, but I think it was like 5.7 grams. So it's interesting. If you want something that's a gram, think of a dollar bill. If you want something that's five grams, think of a nickel. Okay. The second question is, how much greater is the mass of one million dollars in pennies? Than the mass of one million dollars in one dollar bills. Get it? So you would figure out the mass of a million dollar bills. Well, each dollar bill is a gram, so that's kind of easy. And then the mass of a million dollars worth of pennies. Think about how many pennies that would be, and then multiply by your atomic mass of pennium to get that. So for these answers, what I want is what is the difference in them? Like the difference the big one minus the smaller one, and also how many times greater is the big one than the smaller one? Get it? So you divide. So there's two ways I'd like these answers if you wanna do the challenge. The difference between them, the larger number minus the smaller number, right? But also the multiple, the factor, divide the bigger number by the smaller. Like it's this many times greater, like, a hundred times greater, a thousand times greater. Get it? Okay, so you could do one of the challenges or both, but I do want the answers in both forms. So it's a little tricky, I guess. A little bit tricky. And that is the end of the notes on the isotopes of Pentium lab. I hope this turns out to be a good lab. There's a few tricky things on it. And I hope this winds up being your greatest lab ever, the perfect lab of all time. Okay, bye.